Hi, good evening, everybody. My name is David McNally. And I'm the Community Engagement and Blue Light Collaboration Manager for the Northwest Ambulance Service based in the Greater Manchester area. We really appreciate you joining us tonight for what could be one of the most important skills you could ever learn. During the next 45 minutes, I'm going to cover a range of subjects, but the subjects that we're going to concentrate on are how to perform basic life support and how to use an automated external defibrillator like the one I have next to me. I've worked for Northwest Ambulance Service for 24 years now and been a paramedic for 22 of those. And during my time, I've seen many things. But over the most recent years, this has been what we've engaged to do and try and train up as many people in these skills. So like, like the messages said, grab yourself a pillow, sit yourself down and let's join this together. There will be the facility during this to ask questions um, using the team's uh, facility. So if you have got that and you want to ask any questions, please do. And at the end of the session, I'll endeavour to answer as many as possible. What we're going to cover over the next 45 minutes is understand the principles of the chain of survival. This is what we term the Olympic rings of saving somebody's life how to recognise the signs of a cardiac arrest and differentiate of, of what a heart attack is and a cardiac arrest. Be able to apply what we call the doctor's ABC principles when performing basic life support. Understand how to use a defibrillator or an AED and be able to use it safely. So first, let's look at the chain of survival. Like I've just said, the chain of survival is what I term the Olympic rings of saving a life. Because if everything is in place, we're going to give that individual the best chances of saving somebody's life. If everything is done in stages and everybody plays their part, we can all potentially have that successful outcome and in saving somebody's life. So the first link in the chain of survival is early access to the 999 services and requesting an ambulance. If we're finding somebody who's unconscious, not responding, not breathing normally, we definitely need to be ringing 999 and asking for the ambulance service. This is where the first parts of the chain can be started. Once our call takers take that emergency call, they'll be able to ask you some questions and definitively find out what is up with that patient or person. Once they've done that, they can start to initiate what we call telecommunicator CPR which stands for cardiopulmonary resuscitation. And the sooner this is started, the better. But once our colleagues start giving you that information, our ambulance crews are always mobilised as well. So you may receive a car, an ambulance, or even one of our community first responders arriving to help you on scene. The second link is where the general public can play a really key part. And it's what we term CPR or basic life support. The CPR is resuscitating the heart, brain, lungs and kidneys. And what we're trying to do during this phase is keep those four organs which are essential for life perfused with oxygen. If we can keep the oxygen being pushed around the body and being pushed through these organs, it will keep maintaining their life and help sustain life. But if this isn't started, after about four minutes or 240 seconds, the brain can become irreversibly damaged from oxygen starvation. And if this occurs, unfortunately, the brain cannot regenerate and recover from this. So it's key that when somebody does stop breathing, somebody can recognise that very, very quickly, get help on its way, but start to push the chest up and down to push the oxygen around the body. Like I just said, as an ambulance service, we can respond as quickly as possible to these emergencies, and we will do, whether that be one of the response cars, whether that be one of the ambulance ambulances or one of our community first responders, we will get there as quickly as possible. And our paramedics can perform advanced procedures and advanced skills. They can introduce tubes into people's throats to help maintain the airway and provide oxygen to the body. They can place needles into the arm to help give advanced drugs. But if this isn't done before we arrive, we're going to struggle to have a successful outcome. As you can see from the infographic on the screen at the moment, the chain is incomplete. 
And unfortunately, the missing link is one of the key parts to cha- saving somebody's life. And unfortunately, it isn't a mandatory regulation to have these in every available public space. But as an ambulance service based in the Northwest, we endeavour to do this and we work with communities, groups, organisations and charities to place as many external defibrillators in the community to be able to be used by people like yourself on this call. Because if a defib can be brought to the patient's side within the first four minutes of that cardiac arrest, in tandem with good CPR, we can have upward of an 80% chance of survival for that individual. And just like the machine here that I've got next to me, this is as small and as compact as they are. So it's really key that if we know of these machines, one, they are registered with the ambulance service, and two, we know how to get them in an emergency. And I'm going to come on to that later in the talk. At the end of the talk, I'm going to be demonstrating how to perform these skills. And that's where you're going to come in. And if you have got your pillow with you, fine. Kids, if you've got your squishmallow, fine, because that's how we're going to do the CPR. We're going to get down there, place our hands on there and understand how we're going to pose ourselves if we ever have to do this in a real life situation. But like I said, I want you to remember six letters from tonight's talk and one lot of numbers. And the six letters stand for something. The way we refer to it is our doctor's ABC approach. I remember learning this when I was in Cubs, and that's a good few years ago. And I still employ this every time I work as a paramedic operationally. Yeah. When I respond in my car, if I'm faced with a scene or faced with a patient lying there, I'll use that doctor's ABC approach to care and approach the casualty. So let's go through each letter. First and foremost, the D is for danger. Are there any dangers to yourself that are going to present when you approach the casualty? Are you going to become the next casualty if you don't remove that danger from the casualty or the casualty from the danger? It may be above, below, around, underneath, but clear the casualty and make sure they are free from danger. The R is for response. As we can see from the morph character there, a gentle shake and shout of the character can elicit a response. If they move, if they push you away, we know their heart is working and they are breathing to some description. If they don't respond, we need to alert people to help. So if we're in a public place, shout, holler, get some help. But if you're in your home setting, make sure you have either called for help or you've told another friend, relative or loved one that you need help. And then we're going to go on to A. So a patient needs to be lying flat on their back to open their airway. And again, just trying to stimulate a little response from them will help to see if they are unconscious or conscious. When it comes to breathing, we need to be aware of certain things now. If we think there's going to be a prevalence of COVID in this situation, because we are still dealing with the pandemic, we need to place something over the individual's face. But what we're not going to do is place our face over the individual's face to look, listen and feel for breathing. And that's how we used to teach it in a layperson perspective. What we are going to do is look for rise and fall of the individual's chest from a distance to see if there's any reg regular rhythmical change in that chest wall movement. And in normal breathing, there's very little movement of the chest wall. So that's why by placing your hand on their chest, the feel for any movement is key. But we're also going to listen for the sounds associated with normal breathing, which is quiet. So if you approach a casualty and hear a snoring, gasping type breath, that could be a sign of a cardiac arrest. And we're going to treat it as that in this instant, because what happens in the first few minutes of a cardiac arrest, these agonal gasping breaths can occur. And potentially, if they're not treated or, or we mistake those for normal breathing, we can kind of stop the process of actually caring for that individual. But also in a cardiac arrest, people appear very grey, blue and mottled as soon as their heart fails, especially around the peripheries, the skin, the, the face of the patient. Because what happens is the blood constricts and it, it, it centres itself in the core of the body. 
So people in a cardiac arrest become very grey and pallid straight away as their heart fails. They'll lose um, the involuntary muscle movements, so the flickering of the eyelids, the swallowing reflex will also be absent. So if we assume there is no normal breathing or signs of life, we've got to confirm help. If we are by, are by ourselves, we're going to pick up the phone, we're going to ring 999, we're going to place it on speaker and place it next to the casualty. Because our colleagues in EOC, the call takers, can start to talk us through that process. If we have got friends who can get the ambulance for us, we're going to ask them to do that for us and tell them when it's done. Come back and tell me when you've called that ambulance. Like I say, if you do perceive that risk um, of COVID in this area, if it's somebody you don't know outside of your um, home, family and friends groups, what we need to do is think about how we're going to prevent any risk to ourselves from any droplets being expelled from the patient. So we might place a cloak, um, cloth or a towel or even one of the face masks over that individual's face. And that's to stop anything coming out of the patient's mouth. If you have got a mask yourself, yeah, great. Place it on yourself because it will help protect you. But we do this prior to compressions. Once we've done that, we're on to the C element. What the C is, is for compressions. This is where we're going to kneel nice and close to the patient. We're going to expose the chest if there's a jacket on that individual. And we're going to place the hands in the centre of the individual's chest. We're going to place the heel of one hand interlocked with the other hand on top of the chest with our shoulders directly above the midline of the body to start to squash the chest wall. But at the same time, we're going to keep our arms nice and straight and then we push because what that downward compression does is squashes the heart that ejects the blood from the heart and starts to perfuse the body. And the vital organs for this, like I said, are the brain, your heart, your two lungs and your kidneys because that downward compression is key to perfusing the brain with oxygenated blood. And we compress the chest approximately five to six centimetres of the depth of the casualty's chest. Now, if it is a larger patient, five to six centimetres may not be enough. So we look at a third of the depth of the casualty's chest. That's how much we've got to squash. And it's of equal importance that we release fully on the chest wall. And by doing this, what we do then, we allow the heart to fill back up with blood again, oxygenated blood. Because when the heart fails and stops beating, the blood contained within the oxygen just doesn't dissipate out of the body. For the first six, seven, eight minutes, potentially there's enough oxygen in that body to be used around those vital organs. So we're not going to be asking you to do mouth to mouth resuscitation, breathing into a casualty face, even if you know them because the perceived risk is there to you. There may be blood and vomit if the casualties fall in heavily. So once we release fully, we can press again. And we do this at a rate of 100 to 120 a minute. So that's approximately two a second. And it is physically tiring, but by this time your adrenaline will have kicked in and you will have found that strength to do this. So how do we know the rate to be doing it? When I learned to do this, I learned it to Nelly the Elephant, and that's the only kind of song I think in my head. I only know the first verse, and that's where I go with it. But there are other songs that are well known. We look at the Vinnie Jones advert many years ago with the British Art Foundation, and they talk about the Staying Alive tune, because it's the rate of 100 to 120 a minute. And once we've started that CPR, we continue that CPR. Until certain things happen, or other things come into play. So firstly, it is tiring. So if you become tired from performing CPR and there is other people in the area, ask them to take over from you. Ask them to put their hands in the center of the chest and push hard and fast like you've been doing. If we arrive as an ambulance service, we're gonna take over that. But be aware if it's one of our solo paramedics on a car, you may, may be key to carrying on that compressions while our paramedics can get the defib on etc. I mentioned the defib because once the defib is applied to the patient's chest that is where it is key for that machine to take over the care of the individual. So by putting the defib on the chest the machine will then take over and start to analyse what the heart is doing and dictate how it needs to shock and we'll come on to that in a minute. 
And there may be times where our paramedics come and we stop the CPR and we go through all our processes and try and carry out the advanced care of that individual. So that's what the doctor's ABC approach stands for. The dangers, the response of the casualty, shouting for help. Then we look at the airway by lying the casualty flat on the back and assessing for breathing for the normal rise and fall of the chest and any associated sounds. If those are absent, we're going to confirm helps on its way, phone on speakerphone next to the casualty and then start with the compressions. Like I've just mentioned, defibs are key to saving somebody's life. And these machines are integral and are placed in numerous places throughout the community now and shopping centres. You can see through the pictures on the screen, there's a whole different makes, model, colours. They all have different bells and whistles, but fundamentally, an automated external defibrillator all does the same. They all assess the rhythm of the heart. They will all advise whether a shock is needed or not, and then deliver a shock appropriately if it is required. So I can say, if you do have them in your business, your school, your leisure centre, your gym, just keep your eye on them because they're more prevalent than we think. They're a self-contained unit. So the machines themselves have an internal battery that is a non-rechargeable battery that will contain X amount of years worth of life and X amount of shocks depending on the maker model. They have an integral safety and a status indicator. So this device here just below my finger as, excuse me, as a flashing LED diode, which will actually emit a green diode intermittently to show that it's in a state of readiness. The other devices on the screen, some of them have an OK symbol, some of them have a green ball present, some of them have like an egg timer type sim device, um, and some have a tick. But that all shows that, that it's ready to go. If there is a, a problem with the machines during the self-test, which they do some daily, some of them weekly, it will indicate if there's a problem through the diagnostic panel. On this device, the diode turns red. Other devices, the green ball becomes a red ball with a cross. Um, other ones have a cross or the egg timer comes up with an exclamation mark, etc. But that's because the integral mechanisms and, the, and the, the computer systems within them will diagnose if there's any problems. They talk to us, so they will talk us through how to use the device. And this is key. So as long as we're listening to the instructions and taking heed of those instructions, potentially we're going to be able to help save that individual. Other devices as well, depending on the make and model, might have a, a pictorial kind of guide, a visual guide, an LCD screen that takes you through those stages. And internally, they hold the data. So if they are ever used in a resuscitation of a person, we can download that data to share with the onward care of that individual and the cardiology teams within the acute hospitals where we will take those individuals. But like I say, they're a self-contained small unit and anybody can use them. What you don't need to be do is have a green uniform or wear a white coat and a stethoscope around your neck to use them. As long as we listen to the instructions, apply a few safety principles, they are there for anybody to use. How do you know if they're there? Well, that's a key message, really. It's looking for one of the three signs that are on the screen now. So if we look at the one on the far right first, this is the old legacy sign that is still out there within a lot of UK establishments. But this has been changed now to what is the other two signs are. But all in all, they are all by these green safety signs and the kind of running man colour of green. So you can see we've gone away from that electricity bolt to the more refined kind of wiggly line, which represents what a heartbeat would look like on a, on a machine that we do to monitor heart rhythms. And they're calling them defibrillators, heart restarters. The one in the middle is more pictorial, which says, you know, for any unconscious person not breathing normally, this machine is there for. There are still some devices out there in cabinets that say only to be used by medically trained people. And now that isn't the case. Anybody can use these and we can direct people to them if they are needed. So when we looked at some figures from June this year, and this figure has rose since then, accessible AEDs in the Northwest were just shy of about 10,000. And I think we're nearer that figure now, if not over. 
But we classify defibrillators in two ways. We have PAD public accessible defibrillators and community public access defibrillators. If I talk about what we call the PADs, these are machines that are in establishments and buildings. So gyms, shopping centres, leisure facilities, um, entertainment venues, and they are accessible dependent on the opening hours of that venue. The community public access defib are ones that are fitted in external yellow, green, circular boxes, square rectangular boxes that have a coded lock on them within the Northwest. Now these cabinets are heated to keep an ambient temperature in an external environment for that defib. But with it being 24 seven accessible, it allows any member of the community to be directed to it. And whether it be a pad or a CPAD, anybody within a 500 meter radius of that emergency could be directed to that defibrillator if there is more than two rescuers on scene. And only today we've gone live within the Northwest with something called the circuit, which is a national defib database hosted by colleagues from the BHF but it allows people nationally to register defibrillators and they're imported directly into the ambulance service controls to allow us to send somebody to them in an emergency. So we truly hope that that figure of around 10,000 starts to grow massively over the coming weeks and months as more and more people register defibs that they have in their facility. We continue to work with communities, groups and organisations to place CPADs in the community. Because last year in 2020, as an ambulance service, we treated just over 3,000 cardiac arrests. And when we say treated, we, we provided care by the clinicians and the ambulance crews. But 83% of these happened in a place of residence. So housing estates, buildings, houses, not in shopping centres, not in gyms, because we've got defibs there. They happen in the housing estates. So that's why we've got to work with communities to put defibs in their environment. But what really is key and is outstanding is within the Northwest, our bystander CPR rate. So people like yourself who've joined us tonight in 82 percent of our cardiac arrests attended, people are attempting bystander CPR prior to our arrival. And that is phenomenal. But as a group of people, and you're included in this, how do we go from 82 to 90, from 90 to 100? So then we give everybody the fighting chance of survival. And we do that by learning these skills together, having a defib in our community and combining them all together, because together we can all make that difference. So I'll put a question slide up there, but I'm just going to pause there for one minute and just close something down. Hopefully I've all rejoined you. Um, so what we're going to do now, we're going to move across and look at how we perform the CPR. So like I said at the beginning, if you've got your pillow or kids, if you've got your squishmallow, get it, get on your knees and let's go through this together. So here's my friend on the floor. So what I'm going to do now is talk through how we will perform CPR using that doctor's ABC approach. And it's key here, we use it for everyone we may come across. Because if we don't, we may miss things. So first and foremost, is it safe to help that individual? Are there any dangers? to me as a rescuer that are going to hurt me as I approach the casualty because I don't want to become the next casualty. Then I'll check for response. Hello, can you hear me? To try and elicit that response. If they push and shove me away, I know their heart's working and I know they're breathing to some description. If they don't, I'm going to alert somebody for help. Then I'm going to like, make sure the casualty's lying flat on their back. Their airway will be open. And I'm going to assess their breathing by placing the hand on the chest. If they have a large coat on, I may expose the chest by placing the hand on the chest to see the rise and fall. And I'm going to look at the complexion of that individual. See if there's any flickering in the eyelids, any swallowing reflexes present. What I found here, 
that I can't see any normal breathing. So at this point, I'm going to ring 999 by placing my phone on loudspeaker next to the casualty, and I'm going to go into my CPR element. <clears throat> so for the purposes of this, I'm going to expose the chest to show you. So somebody's chest is from here, from my fing both fingers, and we're looking at putting the hands in the centre of the individual's chest. There's no need to feel for landmarks. It's the heel of one hand in the centre of the chest, interlocked, and we start to squash the chest wall. Like so. And what we're going to do is do those compressions like so. So if I just zoom out slightly, you will see arms nice and straight, pushing directly down on the centre of that individual's chest. One, two, one, two, one, two, one, two. And once I've started this, I'm not going to stop until I became too physically tired. Somebody else comes who takes over. Or somebody brings me the defibrillator. Now, if there was a perceived risk of COVID at this time and I was worrying about this, I could, prior to starting the compressions, place a mask around the mannequin. Obviously, the mannequin is no risk to me, but in a real life situation, there may be that prevalence, hence I'll place the mask over the patient's face. So the defibs arrive now. If I'm by myself, my priority now is to use the defibrillator. If I've got somebody else with me, I'm going to carry on doing the chest compressions and they're going to work around me. So firstly, most defibrillators come with a little rescue kit and within the rescue kit it contains a few things it contains a pair of scissors gloves maybe some tissue towel to dry off the face and it also contains a razor so firstly the scissors are there to cut the clothing off that individual and expose the chest wall now whether it be a male or female we need to have direct contact with the skin for the pads to work so if it is a female casualty we cut the bra, expose the chest area, and once we place the pads on that individual's chest, we would respect their dignity and modesty by covering their chest up. The reason we have a razor, if we have a, a patient with an excessively hairy chest, the pads will not adhere to the chest wall. So a razor is there to quick and simply shave the chest to allow the pads to adhere to the chest. Because if they do not adhere to the chest wall, the defibrillator will not go through its phases and work properly. So to use the defibrillator, you would always have it on the side that you're operating it on. But for the purposes of this, I'll put it here so we can see clearly. There is a red arrow on this device. We open the lid and it starts to talk to us. Adult mode. Remove all clothing from patient's chest. Which we've done. Pull red handle to reveal pads. And then look at pictures on pads. And we look at the two pictures. Two pads to bare skin exactly and shown in the pictures. So I'll take one pad. Press pads firmly. And place it on the upper right, just underneath the collarbone of the patient. Apply pads to bare skin exactly and shown in the pictures. I will then take the second pad. Press pads firmly. And place it on the lower left of the casualty. Like so. Apply pads to bare skin exactly and do not touch. Pain. And then the machine will ask me to come away and do not touch do the patient. Everyone clear. Press flashing button. So everybody stand back. There's a large orange button. Stand back. Shock delivered. Provide chest compressions to the beat. The heel of one hand to be in centre of chest. The other hand should be on top of first hand. The machine the then at least five centimeters. The machine then coaches me through the CPR of how to do it on the casual thing. The beep keeps me in the red right, right rhythm. Keep the patient. Keep elbows straight. Use body weight to push.
And the machine would continually talk us through that cycle for a period of two minutes. But during that two minutes, at least five centimetres, the machine will not allow you to shock the casualty. So you cannot inadvertently override these devices. And we would just keep following the instructions until help arrives. After that first two minutes, the machine will reanalyze and if it needs to deliver a shock to the casualty, it will do so. So in essence, it's about good CPR and quick defibrillation to save lives. Because if we can bring those two things together in tandem, we can save lives together. People in a cardiac arrest are having the worst day ever. By you attempting CPR can only do two things. It can help save their lives or it can help potentially give their loved ones the knowledge that everything possibly has been done for them. So on behalf of Northwest Ambulance Service, I'd like you all, um, I'd like to thank you all for joining us tonight. I hope it's um, been informative. Thanks very much for your time. Take care all.